It was Thursday, May 18, 1995, and Manly coach Bob Fulton was home after training when he received a call to return to Phillip Street. Earlier that morning, he was at league headquarters speaking with the Bulldogs' Jason Smith and Dean Pay, who, through manager Sam Ayub, had expressed misgivings about the Super League contracts they had signed in March. Now they wanted to hear more. Fulton got in his car, and by the end of the day, the Bulldogs' pair had signed contracts with the ARL. Within a week, they would be joined by teammates Jim Dimmick and Jared McCracken, striking a tactical blow for the ARL and shifting the balance of power amongst Sydney's rugby league teams. This is the Filthy Four, the 16th chapter in the Rugby League Digest's in-depth investigation of the Super League War. Welcome back to the Rugby League Digest. I'm Michael Adams here with Andrew Paskin. How's it going, Andy? I'm well, mate. How are you? Uh, I'm good. Uh, just at the start, wanted to thank everyone for all the great correspondence we've been getting over the last few weeks. It's become international. I mean, they're probably all expats or Brits, but so good to see all these other countries coming in. Yeah, it is. It's great. And yeah, getting some high quality emails over the last few weeks. So please keep them coming. And as you have been doing already, tell your friends. We really appreciate uh, spreading the word. Now, we've got a great Twitter community. We've got a great Facebook community. We're also on Instagram now, at League Digest. So uh, check that out if you want the uh, the funny pictures and the funny vids. <laughs> Uh, really sell it. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, that out of the way, let's get into this week's chapter. Uh, and I want to dedicate this episode to friend of the show, Nick Tadeshi, who, as far as I know, he coined the phrase, the filthy four in reference to the four Canterbury players <laughs> who defected back to the ARL. So I came across him using this term back on his uh, website, Making the Nut, years ago in his From the Couch column, uh, one of my favorite weekly reads. Uh, in terms of the NRL. And I saw it and I told you about it. And we both thought it was just so funny that 20 years after it happened, he's still calling them <laughs> the filthy four. It's and unreal. then ever since we've just used the term and, and kind of taken it for granted that it's a term that everyone knows. So I, I want to make sure Nick Tedeschi gets his dues as the originator. Yeah, but it's also, it's one of the great rugby league traits holding a feud for 20 years. <laughs> so let's get into it. And I want to set this episode up by giving some context for the climate that led to the four Bulldogs players going back to the ARL. And we've seen that it was a climate of bitterness and hostility being played out in the media. There was also a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes within clubs as players learnt what their fellow teammates were getting, leading to a lot of questioning as to why they weren't getting more. And you can see the Canterbury situation directly coming out of this growing tension. We can see now that it really paid to hang on a bit and, and, and wait for the bidding war to start rather than sign up early. Michael O'Connor's berating you for asking for money early mm -hmm. and then by the end they're just throwing it out. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I'm kicking myself. I've lost the reference where I originally read this, but there was a report that came out that showed that if you signed in, I think it was the third week of, you know, after April Fool's Day, you were in the best position financially. Right. So that was for a number of reasons. It was primarily because of the ARL's fight back. Suddenly there was surge pricing in play. Secondly, now the managers were involved. So there was no more clandestine meetings, uh, keeping any representation away from players. So very quickly, the pricing got out of control. And publicly, a lot of these inconsistencies didn't come out until October, when in the process of the court case, journalists for the first time got the exact contract amounts that everyone was being paid. So you were seeing for the first time, everyone's salaries get reported. And so you, you saw a real spike in the way it played out then. But of course, people within the clubs are you know telling their teammates what they got. So everyone internally was kind of aware what was going on. It was probably the origination of the, I've got to look after my family trope. Yeah. And it was accepted from day dot. Oh, you know, he's got to look after his family. Like just wanton greed was just written yeah. off. <laughs> I'll, I'll read this. Uh, this is from Phil Gould's book, Good as Gold. You would speak to Joe somebody in the morning and put a volume of him, on him of, say, 50,000. A teammate of Joe's would come in that afternoon after talking to Super League and we'd have to give him seventy-five or 80,000 to sign with the ARL. 
The first thing the teammate would do was go back and tell Joe, I got 80,000, you only got 50. We had a real greed situation there for a couple of days and made me sick. <laughs> Certain players and managers were making their decisions solely on the cash being paid. I can't remember too many thank yous being offered by anyone or someone actually saying, gee, that's a bonus when they were handed an extra 50 or 100K. It was all just take. I'm on Gus's side with this. There should have been a bit of uh, gratitude, but I don't imagine Gus was giving back his check either. <laughs> yeah, uh, I am on Gus's side to a point, but when he's going like, oh, no one was saying thank you. It's, <laughs> like this is a situation that he you know, very much <laughs> contributed to creating. Yeah, it's also a business uh, that I'm running. So all this was coming out. You had situations like Paul Sirenen who uh, really got done badly by the ARL. He had a signing bonus of 75000 which in the scheme of things was nothing. So Ciro said, I'm filthy. I was taken badly. I would love to hear from the league. They'd probably say that's because I'm 30, but I'd like to know why I've only got 75000 and other players got what they did. You'd like to think you've given some sort of service to the game, but there's no loyalty shown back. Also for his name as well. His name value is yeah. worth more than 75 grand. Why, why did he sign it though? Yeah, uh, it's true, but it, it is one of those inexplicable things. And I think Sirenan's a perfect example where you could say he was over the hill, but I mean, he'd just come back from his third kangaroo tour. Yeah, for sure. He would go on to play until 1998, one of the greats of his era, yeah. you know, a great of the game. And you're right, he did himself over by signing so early and not long after he signed... He happened to run into Benny Elias on the street and uh, Benny asked him what he was going to do about Super League. And in Ciro's words, when I told the bloke I'd just signed a deal with the ARL, he hit his forehead with his hands and cursed in Arabic. Benny said he and News Limited heavy Ken Cowley were close mates and he probably could have worked out a great deal for me. I don't doubt that Ben Elias is good friends with Ken Cowley. Ben Elias yeah. is friends with everybody. <laughs> that brings me to my Ben Elias memory. In 2002, I believe, he was in the Mercury nightclub in Newcastle. And uh, I bought him and his Mrs. Vodka Cruises. <laughs> I had a good chat for five minutes. Legend. Uh, and among all the other payments that were out of whack, one of them really stuck out, and that was Scott Fulton getting a hundred grand sign-on bonus, <laughs> more than his uh, manly teammates Des Hasler and Cliff Lyons, Fair who got eighty-eight thousand each. Uh, and Jack Gibson summed it up pretty neatly: Scott Fulton's had a little help, hasn't he? <laughs> And that leads us to the poster boy for all of this. And like us, I don't want to embarrass the bloke. <laughs> <laughs> but Steve Edmed. So Steve Edmed, as we heard a couple of chapters ago, was publicly called out by Gus on the footy show for getting a million dollars to sign with Super League. Now, as it turns out, that was a bit of inflation by Gus. But this was one... Unlike all the others that came out in October, this is one that from the first week of April, everyone was scratching their heads and saying, wait, he got that? Well, what am I getting? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what the actual figures, 725 total over three years, wasn't it? Yeah, so it was three years for 225 plus a sign-on bonus of 50,000. So what's that? 725. But he retired after one year. He retired, well, he didn't retire. He went over to England right. to play with Sheffield. So, so, he, so he got the money. He got the money. Thank God. Yeah. Uh, there's one comment in the research the preparation you did was, you know, as a proud player, you know, it upset him all this being the poster boy for the money. Do you think he regrets it? No, of, of course not. Because I'm really happy for him for a start, taking these warring idiots for all they're worth. But it also upsets me a little bit that this guy, he was a real good, tough player in the Tony Butterfield mold. And he's sort of always been mocked since. He has. And yeah, there is a bit of sweetness to that. Uh, but let's hold off on that because mm -hmm. I, I do want to discuss this at greater length. Mm -hmm. But first, I just want to set the scene for this deal and the ramifications of it. Sure so thing. the one thing in all my research I haven't been able to find is how it happened. This was in the first week. So when there was still some kind of a lid on the spending, there was still a cr set of criteria that Super League was working on and yes, that had been blown out a bit by the ARL's fight back, but I haven't found John Rebo or anyone else on record sitting down and said the AdMed situation, this is what happened. Is it possible, given what we've heard before with the contracts, that somebody put an extra zero? It's like, that seems to be the most <laughs> likely scenario. But it, it was actually quite touching his decision to sign and the mixed feelings he had about it. So uh, in his words... I can tell you the last thing I ever wanted to do was to leave the Tigers. No amount of money can ever make a decision like that easy. Yeah. And it was actually 
Balmain board member John Chalk, who had a long career in the NRL, only died uh, late last year, I think it was. He had this to say about it. This was in an article in the Sydney Morning Herald in 2005. Steve had an opportunity to pick up some of the unbelievable money that was around at the time. It was a golden opportunity to help set him up for the future. I told him my heart said don't go, but then I put my father's hat on and said he should consider this as a business decision. Steve had done most of what he was going to do at Balmain, and although I'm sure the ARL would have given him something to stay, it wouldn't have been anything like the Super League money. I like that comment. It's one of the bonuses of having ex-football men administrating out of very few bonuses is that they understand players' perspective. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So he was the poster boy. The other one that was always mentioned in conjunction with Steve Edmund was Craig Coleman who uh, had a $300,000 offer from Super League at a time when he was very much in the wind-down phase of his career. Uh, And when he was offered it, he gave a call to a friend of his who was a respected businessman in Sydney and said, what do I do? And the guy said, sign now. Is respected businessman code for colourful identity? (laughs) Uh, But he probably did best of all out of anyone in Super League because so he signed for Super League in ninety five. When the first court case came down and Super League wasn't allowed to proceed, he was suddenly found signed with Super League, not having an ARL deal in place and having nowhere to go. And no Super League club wanted to sign him because he was finished as a player, basically. So he got the payout from Super League, almost all of the contract, wow. and had a final year at West, I'm sure, playing for not much, but you know, getting his Super League payout. That's unreal. So if you look at Steve Edmed in the context of what the other players are on at the time, there's I've seen the list of players like ranked in contract order. And when you look at the players around him, you've got some players, you know, some young blokes who didn't pan out. The likes of Tyron Smith. I wouldn't say he didn't pan out. He had a, you know, pretty lengthy career in the NRL, probably played like nine or 10 years for a few clubs. So he got paid $230,000 for three years with a $100,000 signing bonus. Probably not worth it in terms of what he achieves as a player. But at the time, they yeah. were, you know... He was considered the next big thing. Yeah, exactly. And then the five players directly ahead of Steve Edmed were Mick Hancock, John Cartwright, Greg Alexander, and Daryl Halligan. Yeah, right. So he really does stand out in that group. So, you know, Tyron Smith, you're paying for promise. The others to, you know, more or less had achieved a lot in the game and, and would have been around that figure. I don't think you can compare Brandy to Steve Edman. No, exactly. But looking at some of the, the players directly behind him and one a bit above him, David Riolo, $240,000 for three years with a $50,000 sign-on bonus. Now, is that not early promise for uh, contract negotiations for his managerial career? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, and the funny thing is he actually ended up turning that contract down to go back to the ARL and stay with Illawarra. Just underneath, Steve Edmed, Danny Lee, 225000 for two years and a $25,000 sign-on bonus. Well, Danny Lee had origins, right? Well, he had one Super League origin in right. 97, played for country in 96, and was the Dalian prop of the year in 95. So even though he was close to the end of his career, he was coming on career best form. So you can kind of understand it. Dean Schifolitti, two twenty grand, four years, $75,000 sign-on bonus. Ian Russell, two hundred grand, three years, fifty thousand. Tony Priddle, same deal. I mean, some of these guys flees to News Corp. <laughs> so <laughs> click goes to shit. <laughs> Wayne Collins, one hundred seventy thousand for three years and a sixty thousand sign-on bonus. So by no means was Steve Admed alone in this. So we all look back on this now with fond memories. We're all laughing at the contracts. The players all got houses out of it, right? The only people that lost were News Corp and PBL shareholders. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But when you do look at that list, players below Steve Edmed, you're seeing evidence of what we've talked about. The players who signed early were the ones that missed out. And I I just went and looked at representative players who got paid less than Steve Edmed by Super League. And almost exclusively, they're players from clubs who were signed up wholesale in the first week. So Canberra and Brisbane dominating, also Cronulla, Canterbury and Auckland. So I counted 28 current, former, or future rep players who got paid less than Steve Edmed, 23 of them came from those five clubs. Wow. They were filthy, in fact, as, <laughs> as we will get to. So let's go back to Steve Edmed and that the fact that he was such a scapegoat. I'm just going to read through some of the statements that were made at the time. Uh, so Peter Fitzsimmons in the Herald. 
While the Australian Test cricketers might have previously considered themselves well recompensed for their efforts, the fact is that most of the Test players in the Windies are now on a third of what a journeyman league player such as Steve Edmed gets for joining Super League. In the Rugby League Week, an article talking about Super League missing the boat on signing Glenn Grief. Super League have since paid bucket loads on the likes of Steve Edmed. Now Edmed's an honest player, but the Tiger stalwart has nowhere near as much to offer as young Grief does, also in the Sydney Morning Herald. Murdoch Super League, where not-so-super players like Steve Edmed suddenly find themselves with bulging wallets and bank accounts in the six-figure league. That's insulting. Uh, in the Business Review Weekly, one of the most frequently mentioned stories of the Rugby League saga has been the good fortune of the Sydney Tigers' first-grade forward Steve Edmed, a handy player, but one who would not make the starting lineups of the stronger clubs in the competition. Roy Masters in the Herald. The ARL figure for an international prop equals only the News Limited offer for a journeyman prop if the $1 million signing of the Sydney Tigers' Steve Edmed is to believe, and Phil Gould in the book Good as Gold. Super League, desperate for players, ignored Edmed's decade of service and minimal impression of the representative scene and paid him $50,000 immediately to join their ranks and then a further two twenty five dollars a season for three years. And this kept going all the way through. It's a bit crook saying a million dollars. I mean, yeah. like it's two hundred and seventy five dollars over back then yeah exactly so it was way off although that was a figure that was being reported yeah and let's go back to the phil gould thing that was the figure that he quoted on the footy show are we still talking about steve edmed in this context today if not for edmed being outed on the footy show yeah i agree it, it seems like almost immediately that was the the punchline was steve edmed I mean, it is a standout contract. We're not going to pretend it's not. But, I mean, there's other ones. And this guy's his whole life's going to be remembered for that. Yeah, exactly. Like So, going right through to recent times. So, Josh Massoud in the Daily Telegraph in 2008. If league fans earned a dollar every time that was trotted out, they'd be handed more money than Steve Edmed during Super League. Bit clunky as well as unnecessarily <laughs> cruel. But again, he he laughs all the way to the bank. Yeah, exactly. And so he went to North Queensland for 1996, won their Player of the Year award. See, there you go. Tim Sheens came in in 97 and moved a lot of players on. Out of the 37 players that were around, I think only 17 of them remained for the the following season. (laughs) Tim Sheens put a broom through the place so he could uh, be clean at the bottom of the table. (laughs) (laughs) And so he, he went off and finished his career in England. But he got that money. He came back. He had cash for a house in the inner west, started a TAFE course, became a builder and, you know, has his own business today because of that. I'd love to see his portfolio now based on that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Like, so I'm sure he's doing all right. And in an interview, he said that he didn't love the fact that he was used as a scapegoat. He was a bit dirty on the way he was talked about. But ultimately, I, I think he can see that he's a winner out of all this. I mean, true rugby league fans know what a good player he was. Yeah. Wholehearted. Yeah, he's, exactly. He's respected for that. It's only uh, media dipshits, really. And the other bad thing about that is honest toiler shouldn't be a derogatory term. No, it, it's it like kind of the lifeblood of rugby league and every club has them and needs them. And yet it's used derisively. Well, let's compare his uh, reputation to Bill Peden's. Bill Peden could be carried on the shoulders of Nova Castrians wherever he walks. Yeah. And uh, hasn't bought a beer since 1993. Yeah. And um, for Steve Edmund, it's a punchline. Yeah, exactly. Uh, maybe if they could have got over the line in 89, it's a, a different story. <laughs> <laughs> so Edmund's quote on this is, I've moved on from the whole Super League thing now anyway. I've got a family and business and I've stepped away from the football scene as far as direct in- involvement goes. But I still love the Tigers and I go to their games and sit on the hill. I'm pretty happy to see the Cowboys doing well now too. And just to finish the Steve Edmed segment, I just want to quote that same Greg Pritchard article in the Herald from 2005. Uh, And this was John Chalk being quoted. There are a lot of young players who wasted the money, Chalk says. Some sad cases actually. Uh, And back to Pritchard. Edmund wasn't one of those. He was a winner. Good stuff. And so we've touched on the situation that allowed the Edmed contract to be played out so publicly. And we've also mentioned the fact that it was these kind of signings that caused players who'd signed early to feel unhappy. So I want to get into that in a bit more detail. And part of the reason for this was that Super League's plan was carefully calculated. We've seen the way they planned their actual raid with great detail, if lacking in foresight. The way they structured their contracts was exactly the same. So they had a set contract based on different criteria, what you'd achieved in the game, everything like marketing potential, even the city where you were going to be based, all these things came into the dollar value that was assigned to you. And this was 
carefully calibrated across all the players that they thought they were going to get. And obviously within a week that had gone out the window, but they'd already signed well over 100 players. And so throughout April, this was causing a lot of internal dramas at the clubs like the Broncos, the Raiders, etc. Externally, that was going public by early May. And you have to remember, it wasn't until the end of May that everything came out with the Bulldog situation. And Super League's response didn't help the situation. So this was John Rebo on the 24th of May. We're not going to throw bucket loads of money at two players who've been fed a line that they've been underpaid compared to other players. They've not been underpaid. Their Super League contracts are not out of kilter with other contracted players of similar standing. They're being paid in the market value as we see it. We've doubled players' salaries and substantially increased the wages of players in their own best interests. We will not be a party to it. It's blatant greed and we will not be held to ransom by mercenary players at the expense of the players who have signed with us in good faith. How'd that work out? <laughs> <laughs> and also using the terms like like mercenary, which was like the exact like ARL kind, kind <laughs> of word, <laughs> yeah. like how quickly do the rebels become the establishment? <laughs> but privately at least they were taking steps to fix this situation. So a lot of the Broncos players were unhappy. Steve Renoff said that when he heard what other players were getting called up John Rebo to say, what's the go? And Rebo ended up topping up him along with Clyde and Stewart and a lot of the other top Broncos and Raiders players. Uh, This also happened at the Dogs where most of the players, including the three out of the four ARL defectors, got extra money put on top of their contracts. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, the one of the four to miss out was Jared McCracken, who, when he went to Chris Anderson to say, am I getting a contract top up? Anderson said, oh, you're doing pretty well, so don't worry about it. There's those famous people skills at the family club. Exactly. And we've got a lot of McCracken talk at the back end of the episode, but that's an early sign of, of how that relationship was to play out. It's so funny across all this story and every history corner we've done, the root of all problems in rugby league is disrespect. Yeah. It's like you've got to show overt respect yeah, to rugby yeah. players and officials or face the consequences. Yeah, exactly. So topping up the players' contracts did go some way to quelling the tension and, and we didn't see mass defections after that. Everyone was happy to stay with their club except for the Bulldogs four. Now we're going to get to the subject at hand. It's these four players, Jason Smith, Dean Pay, Joe McCracken, and Jim Dimmick, and why it played out the way it did. So to do that, we're going to start by going back to March 30th, the night that those four Bulldogs players, along with four of their teammates, signed, and go into why they were so unhappy in the aftermath. So at that signing meeting, we get another kind of Rashomon situation with accounts of what happened when they signed. So... Jared McCracken was the first of those Bulldogs players to sign. And so, in effect, he was the first player to sign with Super League. And in John Rebo's words, he was walking on air. He was that happy. He was wrapped. He was saying, how good's this? So <laughs> a- another first, the first, how good's this to be uttered <laughs> that way. <laughs> but this version is disputed by McCracken in his book, A Family Betrayal, uh, where he said, while the figure I'd agreed to was the most cash I'd ever made, I didn't feel in the mood to run out and buy a magnum of expensive champagne and celebrate. The little voice in the back of my mind was screaming that I had done the wrong thing and I didn't feel good about myself. And once the players had gone public and gone back to the ARL, you saw a number of reasons being given as to why they were so unhappy and what prompted them to go back. So we're just going to go into some of these reasons. One has to do with the concept of duress, which we've talked a lot about these contract negotiations. A couple of aspects of it that apply to the Bulldog situation was the sense they got from the talks that it was now or never. If they didn't sign now, they were going to miss out. That also played into signing the contracts now was their only way to stay with the dogs going forward. And despite everything that was going on this is how rugby league players are generally built that they just want to stay with their teammates and they don't want to rock the boat unless they have to and in mccracken's view a stunt like pulling out chris anderson's signed contract at the negotiations on march 30 to show mccracken that anderson was signed was one of those ways that he was basically told this is the way canterbury's going if you want to stay and play with your mates you've got to sign with us and this uh, is reinforced by what dean pay said in an affidavit where he said I signed the Super League contract because I believed it was the only way I could stay with Canterbury. If Canterbury hadn't organised that meeting, I would not have been there. Mm. 
And the other big thing is the lack of representation. This was that famous incident where Simon Gillies asked if he could call his wife to <laughs> tell her where he was. Rebo said no, because if it was my wife, she'd be over the fence talking to <laughs> <laughs> One of my favourite parts of the whole thing. <laughs> and as McCracken says, the Super League contract was a complicated 22-page document filled with a vast array of clauses, ranging from employer-employee relationships to players' obligations and sponsorship responsibilities. I've no doubt the complexity of the deal would have challenged any top-notch solicitor, let alone a mere footballer. And that was a point I made clear to Rebo. I told him I was an athlete, not a legal eagle, and I wanted my <laughs> solicitor to examine the contract before putting pen to paper. And then after the signing... They were also put out by the fact that any attempts to contact Rebo or anyone else with Super League uh, weren't being met. So they'd you know, heard about the contracts and everything else going on. They'd try to call Rebo and he wouldn't get back to them. You know, He was busy signing players in Perth or wherever he was. So it led to a, a growing sense of unease about what they'd gotten themselves into. I reckon there was unease on Rebo's side too, going, what have we opened up here? <laughs> And then the last one, just the minor insignificant detail of money. <laughs> so this was clearly something that McCracken in particular thought about a lot. And at the contract negotiations, he actually asked Rebo, what are you going to give Steve Renoff? And Rebo said, the same as you. And McCracken actually forced Rebo to put an extra year in the deal so he would be the highest played center. Well, I didn't know he had that in him. It adds up now, I think about it. I was going to say. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and in the Rugby League week after going back to the ARL, he said, to be fair, I don't want a whole heap of money and I don't want too little. I want to be in the middle and get what the likes of Paul Harrigan and Brad Fittler are getting. The middle? <laughs> <laughs> so as with everything, you can talk about duress and you can talk about Rebo not returning their calls, but this is what it basically came down to. The four players seeing a value placed on other players and thinking about what they'd achieved in the game and their own potential and thinking they'd been dudded. And when I say it was all about money, I don't want that to be seen as criticizing them. Like, I think it's a reasonable position to take if you're Dean Pay or, you know, Jared McCracken, an international center, seeing some of these contracts and thinking you're worth more. Yeah. And for the most part, McCracken in particular owned the situation that he thought he deserved more. So he explored his options and got a better deal with the ARL. Uh, but this made me laugh in his book. He was talking about the prospect of playing against Australia in a rest of the world team and how excited he was about that <laughs> prospect. Uh, and then he said, the ARL also offered to better the money Super League agreed to pay me. <laughs> Just add, added bonus. <laughs> The rest of the world. <laughs> and so, as I said, the rumor mill started to build from early May. And it was the end of the month that it all came out publicly. But there was a lot going on behind the scenes to get there. So let's go into that. And as awareness of their dissatisfaction grew, the ARL caught wind of it. And it was actually two of the player managers who made the first moves. So Sam Ayub and Wayne Beavis were both involved in getting the players to go back to the ARL, where they met with Bob Fulton and everything went from there. Well, the Wayne Beavers, Phil Gould connections, probably what started that, wouldn't you think? Yeah, exactly. And this is where, when you see all the comments, when we talked about the actual Blitzkrieg and the, the Phillips Street response and seeing the player managers basically, you know, dispute any evidence that they were connected with the ARL. It's like you can say that as a technicality, but you can see these connections with people like Phil Gould when they started their super agency the next year, something like 80% of their players were ARL players. So there were clear connections there. Also, it's a relationship business, yeah. probably. Yeah. <laughs> And so, as I said at the start, Dean Pay and Jason Smith signed first, and it was strongly rumoured that McCracken and Dimmick would be joining them. And this caused the first set of crisis talks at Canterbury. I really think this was a major turning point in the war because I, I remember vividly thinking, well, oh, man, Canterbury's like, like really unappealing now to watch, and Parramatta's now got a whole lot more appealing. And yeah. To me, it was all about who had the best players mm. as a fan. It was just like, it's clear to say who's got the better comp, who's got the best players. And yeah. like, that really put a dagger in the heart of Super League. Yeah, me. yeah. And I mean, it's, it's no coincidence that Canterbury really struggled on the field the following year. I mean, take out those four players, like that's a massive hole. So after the first two players had signed, McCracken and Jim Dimmick were called into an office with Bullfrog, who basically unleashed on them, calling them mercenaries and talking about loyalty and all the rest of it. <laughs> but Bullfrog was doing a 
a one man good cop bad cop with this routine so <laughs> blasting them in the meeting and then as McCracken tells it calling him up late in the evening at home and saying after a couple of like, yeah, Johnny Walkers yeah and and saying look mate I like you better than the other three. I really want you to stay at the club. I'll look after you financially. No one will know about it. Not John Rebo, no no one. It'll be worth your while. (laughs) Is there any chance the other three players didn't receive an identical (laughs) call that night? (laughs) And after that, with a bad taste in their mouths for how the meeting went, Jim Dimmick and Jared McCracken went to the ARL. Jim Dimmick was in two minds, didn't know what to do. So he sought counsel from his mum, calling her up and asking what she thought he should do. And she said, you do best for Jimmy. So with the players going to the ARL, it was time to tell Chris Anderson about it. Uh, And in the Sun-Herald, Paul Kent reported the following. Pay, with his three mates in tow, approached Anderson midway through a beer at Canterbury Leagues Club and asked if they could have a word with him in private. All four went to a vacant upstairs room where Smith and Pay revealed they'd signed while McCracken and Dimmick revealed they were thinking seriously about joining them. Anderson's response was not pretty. He kicked a chair and said, you can all get fucked, and stormed out. (laughs) Uh, And that account of the situation is basically word for word what Jared McCracken wrote in his book. So I don't blame Anderson for that, but that's not the best chance of uh, salvaging the situation. No, because... (laughs) (laughs) He stormed out of the room and Jim Dimmick had to call out and say, me and Crackers haven't signed yet. (laughs) And Anderson doubled down on it with a warning to the players saying, well, as for this club, I'll tell you, if your Super League contract doesn't stand, you'll be playing for more bank for the next two years. You are contracted to this club and if Super League does win the case, you can fuck off. We don't want you here. You can go and play for another club. And so that uh, tells you what happened in the immediate aftermath with the first two signings dropped for the next week's game. So so originally they were slated to play uh, for Moorbank, playing at Ringrose Park. Uh, in the end, they were saved that indignity and were named on the reserves bench for reserves. So they didn't have to go play park football. The Moorbank administrators will be licking their lips. <laughs> Four ringings. And so this was the start of some typical for the Bulldogs inner turmoil at the club as the fallout of the decision went around all levels. So from management, there was some public settling of scores and isolating the players, trying to cast them in that mercenary light. Uh, Gary Hughes in The Australian sounded off against McCracken saying, without giving you the actual figures, Jared McCracken is our highest paid player. With the contracts our players sign with Super League, Jared is still our highest paid player. The Australian coach offered him twice that amount of money to sign with the ARL. Now, if Jared McCracken signs that contract, it will make him hundreds of thousand dollars in advance of our best ever player, Terry Lamb. From a club point of view, that doesn't sit very well with us. And as McCracken rightly noted, like Terry Lamb was like retiring. Like, yeah, yeah. Despite everything he'd done in the game, like you're not signing him from West in 1983, you know. I just don't understand how one guy is a hero for signing a big deal and the other guy is the worst in the world. Yeah. Paul Harrigan has done the best for his family, but Jared McCracken hasn't. Like- yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I guess it is the signing the second contract. And well, I mean, rugby leagues is more backflips than well, gymnastics. Yeah, because funnily enough, when the four players signed, there was a report in the Rugby League Week that said, the decision of Payne Smith to sign with the ARL lifted the number of players to have signed with both warring factions to more than 20. <laughs> <laughs> and when they did the Rugby League Week players poll later in the year, the option was, um, who have you signed with? ARL or Super League. I think it was something like 10% said both. <laughs> but I don't have any uh, sympathy for either camp given their uh, Stasi-style negotiation tactics. Yeah, exactly. And this is another situation where the ARL lose the moral high ground. Like you can't go on to this, you know, take a man at his word and, you know, handshake deal and all the rest of it. It's like if a man's only as good as his word and you put stake in that as a value... Don't you have a moral obligation to take him as at his word and yeah, leave him yeah. be? Yeah, yeah. And and again, like all's fair in love and war. Like we're not really casting blame on this, but yeah, it's hypocritical to the max. So management sounded off publicly. This spread to the players, where Simon Gillies came out and criticised the players for signing, saying, "I told all four players after they'd talked to Chris Anderson that I was disappointed they hadn't talked to the club, and even more disappointed they hadn't talked to the senior players at the club." I told them I was hurt and disgusted because they could have discussed it with us. 
These blokes have walked out on a player, Terry Lamb, who'd do anything for any player at Canterbury. We all said we'd stick together because that's what mates do. And the people that signed haven't done that. <laughs> it's funny this like loyalty owed to Terry Lamb. <laughs> like that should be an, a factor in your decision. <laughs> well, the family's not going to eat this year, but <laughs> Terry Lamb has got our loyalty. And, and then a couple of contradictions in Gilly's account saying that he thought he'd been personally dudded by the contract he initially <laughs> signed. Then came out and said, football players aren't known to be intelligent. The thing a football player relies on is good advice. And in this situation, they didn't get any advice. And I was like, yeah, that's kind of the point they're arguing. <laughs> he's, um, <laughs> he's astute enough to realize footy players aren't that bright. Not astute enough to walk out of the room and... Talk to lawyer, but. Uh, but the the other side isn't that bright either. So in his book on page 33, Jerry McCracken says, Simon Gillies, an eight-year bulldog, surprised me when he vented his spleen on ABC radio. He gave all four of us a punishing serve, which I considered a major disappointment as he never really said anything to us, well, to me at least, about his disgust. Five pages earlier, page 28. When we returned downstairs, we were intercepted by Terry Lamb and Simon Gillies, and both were determined we should stick solid with them, the team and Super League, and I could sense a feeling of annoyance in their voices. I also had the impression both were directing their words at Jimmy and me. Perhaps Anderson had heard Jim's cry after all. Simon kept saying, you can't do it, crackers, you can't do it. <laughs> he, never, he never said anything. Who's proofreading this book? <laughs> and this turmoil led to their on-field fortunes dipping as well. After starting the season with three straight wins, before April Fool's Day, they ended up losing five of their last eight. Uh, the low light of that being a loss to Parramatta, who'd been flogged by 40 points by St. George the previous week and will win only three games all year. And that game caused commentators to make the connection to what was going on off-field and their on-field form. Steve Mortimer saying, If the love of money is the root of all evil, there was certainly enough evil about here to suggest the club was done for the year. Confirmation came against the Parramatta Eels on Friday night. Now the repair job has to be undertaken, and I fear so much damage has been done it could take forever. Didn't Steve Turvey Mortimer do a ad for Clubs New South Wales? Yeah. <laughs> but obviously they went on to win the comp that year, so they managed to turn the ship around okay. And if anything, it just goes to show you what we talked about in our Bullfrog episode, that winning is in the woodwork, but so is the club imploding, but still managing to... Yeah, but also you get the power of a siege mentality when there's something like this going on. Yeah, exactly. And as we know, there's no stronger power in rugby league than siege mentality. <laughs> and Chris Anderson said as much. He said, I think we're a lot more committed now to what we're about as a club. We went off the rails for a while before I was here. The Warren Ryan and Phil Gould eras. I think we went off the rails then. We had success on the field, but we weren't playing the Canterbury style of football. <laughs> and there was second. turmoil within the club. Off the rails? They won multiple <laughs> comps. <laughs> they made constant grand finals in one comps. Yeah. That's off the rails, is it? Well, it just goes to show you it's Canterbury's natural state. <laughs> and for the most part, Anderson was able to forgive the filthy four or three quarters of them. And despite being dropped initially, they made their way back. Jim Dimmick, of course, went on to win the Clive Churchill in the grand final. Gun player. And there's no way they make the grand final without him, without Jason Smith and Dean Pay. So Chris Anderson could get over his initial disgust in the sake of winning. But there was something about the Jared McCracken situation that was different. And so now we're going to talk for an extended period about Jared McCracken and how his 1995 played out. Was it the long blonde hair that annoyed <laughs> Anderson? So let's start with that because there is a touch of the lair to Jared McCracken and on paper it seems like he would be the perfect candidate for a Super League player. Like I, I much more see him as the prototypical Super League signing than the face of the ARL fight back. Yeah. It's funny how it played out with him and in the court case – uh, at one point, he was asked about the value of different players. You know, he was asked to rate himself against this player and that player. One of the criteria he was asked about was marketability. And they asked him about how he compares to Andrew Eddinghausen, uh, to which he said, 
you know, oh, he's a good looking bloke, but so am I. I'd say we're we're pretty comparable. <laughs> well, he's an out front guy, and that goes to show with his uh, property development. Yeah. Rise and fall with you driving the Bentley around and mm. killing it in the property development game. Yeah. So his book is at this week's book recommendation and you can take this book as you want to take it. I know Nick Tedeschi said that at Belmore Oval in 95 there were book burnings of it. <laughs> <laughs> what is it with fire and rugby league grandstands? <laughs> Keep so, the fires out. As, as I said, uh, you may have to take a lot of this with a grain of salt, but I saw great value in the book. Uh, maybe I, remember, it, I remember reading it when I was young and loving yeah. it. It was like, so, so entertaining. I think definitely an unreliable narrator. There's a lot of stories I'd like to hear from the other side, um, but there's a lot of great content in it. So uh, this book provides, I guess, the backbone of, of what we're going to talk about in this McCracken segment. And he does go back to the start of the relationship between he and Chris Anderson. And you can already see some uh, seams starting to pull apart even before Super League, just because they were different characters on a lot of levels. Uh, and I'll, I'll let McCracken tell the story. Prior to our much-publicized bust-up, we enjoyed a pretty good relationship. I'd tell the jokes, Chris would laugh at them. <laughs> <laughs> we don't live all that far apart from one another on our farms, and we'd often drive to and from training together or share a cab from the airport after playing a match in the state. It was never a laugh riot, but it was always amiable. Nevertheless, I always believed in my heart of hearts that Chris does place a use-by date on some people. And once we fell out, and I still reckon that was because he believed I was the ringleader among the four defectors, I knew it would take a lot of effort to rebuild that bridge. He didn't speak to me. He didn't laugh at my jokes anymore. Hell, Chris didn't even acknowledge me. How is he the ringleader if he hadn't signed at the time? Yeah, and he reiterates this difference between them by saying, on a personal level, the pair of us are as different as chalk and cheese. He's a conservative, quiet bloke who rarely lets his hair down, even while he's out on the drink. I'm the exact opposite. I don't mind raising a bit of racket and lots of hell. <laughs> he sounds like he's a real raconteur, <laughs> in his own words. And so after McCracken was dropped, this tension came out in the open and anything McCracken did to try to get back in Anderson's good graces uh, was met with you know, a, a stony silence. So even when Matt Ryan got injured at one point in the season and Anderson was forced to play McCracken in first grade again, he made sure to tell McCracken, you're only here because Matt Ryan is injured. You've shown no loyalty to us and I'll be the same with you. It's a very rugby league thing to do to make a scapegoat. Canterbury did the exact same thing the previous year by dropping Darren Smith for deciding he wasn't going to re-sign with them, yeah. which is the most arbitrary step to take. And we've said it before, but I, I always am surprised when coaches take this position on particular players. Yeah, it's like Justin Hodges. Yeah. I think Larry just comes into it. Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. come into it with McCracken for yeah, sure. Yeah, exactly. So the relationship between them deteriorated as the season went along uh, to the point that late in the year, the Bulldogs were going on a harbour cruise as a bonding exercise. And although he had the invitation, this was what McCracken had to say about it. While I was invited to go, I figured discretion the better part of valour. I firmly believed had I gone aboard that vessel, anything could have happened between Anderson and me. I feared a shouting match or worse, something that might have sent the club's slight premiership aspirations adrift. While such bonding sessions can work wonders, they can also be a formula for disaster. Because if a vulnerable bloke has had too much to drink, there's every chance he could go crazy and not hold back with the aggro. <laughs> I think it's a good rule of thumb, no bonding sessions on the high seas for rugby league. <laughs> and in McCracken's estimation of the situation, his response was to take these slights in his stride to not have any response to when Anderson bagged him at training or you know, left him out of the team or, or did whatever he was doing. In McCracken's telling of the story, he just was a cheery bloke who <laughs> just just got along with things. He sees himself as the fond. Yeah. <laughs> so this was one incident, as McCracken tells it. Like the time we played West at their Campbelltown home ground. Now, I live quite close to Campbelltown, 
and could have driven there under my own steam. Instead, I observed the normal policy of driving to Belmore and meeting with the other blokes to catch the team bus. Lo and behold, when I lobbed there, I learnt all the guys who lived west of Canterbury had been granted special permission to drive direct to Campbelltown in order to save them time. From my seat on the bus, it appeared as though all of them, except me, had been advised of the arrangement. I was furious because for the sake of a quick phone call or a message from one of the officials, I'd been committed to an 80-minute round trip all in the name of mind games. I was furious, but I bit my tongue. Do you think there was anyone on that bus not aware that McCracken was unhappy. Like I just see him like sitting in, in the front, like by himself, just like anger on his face. Definitely. <laughs> and one of the sources of tension between the two of them was Anderson's belief that Jared McCracken was trying to recruit other players to sign with the ARL. So there was an incident where McCracken was talking to Daryl Halligan about his ARL deal and what they might do for him. And the way McCracken tells it, he came up to me. I, I, you know, like, I was, he was just asking me questions and I answered them, you know. I wasn't recruiting for the ARL. I've got to say, given his entrepreneurial streak, I can see him wanting to get involved. Yeah. And being a big man type thing. Well, this is the thing. All of these stories, he's always got an answer. And we'll see a few more of them as we go on, um, which is convenient at the least. And this came out in a couple of defining incidents that ultimately severed the relationship between McCracken and Canterbury. The first came in that game against Parramatta where McCracken was replaced at half time, and reports were that he left the ground and went home in anger. So this was reported in the papers at the time and he ended up having to front the Bulldogs board about it. So in his version of it, that was utter crap, direct quote. Uh, And his account is that he and his wife were heading up to Port Macquarie for the weekend after the game. So why would he leave and go home when he was waiting for her to pick him up? And he said he did have an alibi at the club, but they never asked him about it. (laughs) Alibi. (laughs) (laughs) So that was incident number one. Uh, Incident number two, probably uh, the more severe one, was Terry Lamb's last home game at Belmore, uh, or what was supposed to be before he came back in 96, uh, and a perceived snub by McCracken who didn't attend the on-field celebrations or the post-match party. And McCracken's version of it is he was the only player to not be given tickets for his family. So he said that he told his family that they weren't going to go because you know he wasn't going to have them sitting on the hill at Belmore, so they'd stay home. But his son misinterpreted it as he wouldn't be going either. And so the son got really upset when, you know, he packed his kit and walked out the door. So Jam McCracken decided then that he was going to take him to McDonald's for dinner. Jesus. And so I'll just read this. The plan was that all the first graders would shower and change into their collar and tie and escort Terry to a podium where he'd receive a gold watch for outstanding service to the club. I didn't consider myself a part of the first grade squad and I didn't want to give the impression that I believed I was. As I left the dressing room, a club director, George Corey, asked me to attend the, the aftermatch function, but I declined his invitation. I'd taken it as an invitation because at no time in the lead up to the farewell was I told the shindig was compulsory. However, as I told George, not only did I feel as though I wasn't a first grader, but I also had an important engagement to attend, Jacob and a junior burger with fries. <laughs> I'll just say this you can't make a bloke feel incredibly unwelcome and then expect him to be yeah you know attending all the events yeah exactly but, but I would think there's a player he would respect Lamb well his version of it is I didn't snub Lamb he said basically I went into the dressing room and shook his hand and wished him well so maybe an inadequate response to the situation well that's something at least yeah uh, but so he says that he didn't snub him. But like the vibe of hatred towards you yeah. is not going to make you want to attend club yeah, events, yeah, is it? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and neither is maybe the greatest snub of all. While the other three defectors were treated with favoured son status, I was well on the outer. For instance, at Canterbury's annual auction night, the bid Michelle and I made on some outdoor garden furniture was completely ignored in preference to the bid of someone else who offered exactly the same amount of money. <laughs> Mr. 
based out on the garden furniture. This is one of the big casualties of the war. <laughs> so it was rapidly deteriorating at Canterbury, uh, which would ultimately see the relationship fall apart in the lead up to the grand final. But before we get there, there was also a lot going on internationally. So the New Zealand team, unlike Australia, didn't place any restrictions on ARL players. Of course, the board was signed with Super League, but it was open slather for whoever was good enough to play for the team. Got a lot of respect for that, but uh, let's be real. They didn't have a lot of... Uh... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like They had no choice, but it was still something good to see in this war that both sides came together and there was, for the most part, no tension between them. I say for the most part because I'm about to recount <laughs> tension? one of my favorite stories <laughs> in this whole war. This is a quote I've been wanting to read for a long time, so I'm glad I'm getting the opportunity tonight. Uh, and I'm going to take us back to Matthew Ridge's book, Take No Prisoners, <laughs> which reading it back, like I'm sure that he wrote it like Jack Kerouac style, like a single scroll of typewriter paper, <laughs> <laughs> like ultimate stream of consciousness, no ghostwriter. That's the interview I want the most for RLD. Yeah, if yeah. anyone knows Matthew Ridge, please reach out. <laughs> So uh, I, this is a very lengthy quote, but I, I have to read it in full. Uh, and, and again, this book is so good. And so, I've never read a rugby league book with such a personal voice. <laughs> like no other person on the planet could have written this book. So this relates to an incident between McCracken and Ridge after a New Zealand test victory against France. We're drinking away and I'm taking the mick out of Jared. It's probably not the wisest thing to do because I know he's under huge pressure. He's being sued by Super League for returning to the ARL. I'm privy to some pretty good information because of my stance with Super League, and I know what he's done. He signed two contracts, one with the Rebels and one with the ARL. But he's caught in a tricky situation, and he feels as if he was misled. Crack, as I say, I hope you got a good lawyer, and I hope you know what you're doing, because you know they're going to go for you. And that's all I say on the subject, because I know it's been tough for him. <laughs> the night continues. We have a few more drinks. We're giving each other a bit of good-natured banter. I'm taking the piss out of his get-up. Where do you get those shoes from, crackers? You look like a bogan, mate. What about your shirt? <laughs> Jarrah must be thinking, hey, you're taking the mickey out of me in front of my mates. That's all I need, another guy having a go at me. It's not meant like that, of course. It's just a bit of fun. And if he's sending me warning signals, they're sailing right past in a drunken haze. At this stage, all he has to do is say, Ridgie, I don't appreciate this. You're giving me heaps in front of my friends. Back off, mate. And I will. Instead, he picks up a glass and throws it at me. I duck. It misses and hits a woman behind me in the back of the head. I'm like, shit, man. I can't believe he's thrown the glass at me in the first place, and I'm shocked that it's hit the woman. The woman isn't saying anything to us. She's playing it pretty low-key for whatever reason. Are these two white ribbon ambassadors? Or? <laughs> I'm genuinely stunned. I'm thinking, whoa, what's going on here? Man, I've pushed the wrong button. Jared grabs me by my shirt. His face is all screwed up and his eyes are flashing with rage. I demand respect, Ridgie, he spits out at me. I demand respect. But it's comical. He's gone from throwing a glass at me for hassling him about his clothes, and I'm thinking that's pretty weird in itself, to shaking me and threatening me and demanding respect. <laughs> and I start <laughs> laughing. I'm not laughing at him. It's more like, oh, you're kidding, mate. What are you, Jared? You're kidding, aren't you? <laughs> He lets me go. <laughs> Far out, mate, I say. What have I done? And as he walks away, he just goes crunch and elbows me in the face. It doesn't hurt too much. I've been elbowed plenty of times. It doesn't knock me over or anything like that. The only thing that stuns me is the fact that he's doing it. I say, oh, far out, mate. You've lost it. I put my drink down. Come on, Richard, let's go. I'm actually hurt by the whole incident. <laughs> This has got to go into some sort of time capsule. <laughs> and and they did sort it out swiftly the next day. Ridge went up to McCracken and apologized. And McCracken said, yep, it, it's all sweet. Let's just not talk about it. Uh, but I have to give McCracken's account of the same incident. Those who know him as a teammate readily can see that Matt Ridge is an Olympic class stirrer. He hones in on a target like a dog with a bone and refuses to let go. Much to the annoyance of the person on the receiving end, he made the mistake of picking me after we'd hit the grog fast and hard that hazy night in June. 
He paid out on my decision to embrace the ARL, and in light of all the drama I'd endured, it was the last thing I wanted to hear. I told him to drop the subject because up until his appearance, I was having a good time with my brother and buddies. I didn't go looking for any grief from him, but he refused to heed my warnings, even after I snapped and said, I think I should command a bit more friggin' respect than that from you. I won't be belittled by you or anyone. But good old Ridgie kept pushing until, bang, he was forced to leave the club. It was an unfortunate incident, and one which dampened our victory over the French. <laughs> No mention of the woman, or <laughs> she was playing it low key. <laughs> She's probably unconscious. <laughs> I love the uh, exactly how he talks, Matthew Rich. <laughs> Far out, mate. You lost it. <laughs> but back at the dogs, by you know mid to late in the season, basically after the test series, he was all but out of first grade, playing the odd game when a player got injured, but largely left out of the team. This wasn't met with you know universal applause at canterbury there were a lot of confused fans wondering why they weren't picking and who does it help yeah it's madness and then chris anderson came out and said that it was just on form he was the the fourth center yeah, in right. the depth chart you know like we just think matt ryan and stephen hughes are ahead of him at this point in time uh and, and again not everyone at the club shared that opinion uh club manager alan nelson at a board meeting yelled that if Matt Ryan and Glenn Hughes were better centres, then he'd gladly eat shit. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. And then after the Bulldogs' semi-final win against St. George in the first week of the finals, McCracken basically sealed his fate. So they were hanging around in the dressing room after the match. And uh, in his words, I offered a couple of blokes my heartiest congratulations. I spied Anderson out of the corner of my eye, analysing the team's statistic sheets. I felt inspired to do something. I wanted to break the ice with Anderson in an attempt to forge the way for me to contribute something to the club's surge towards the grand final. So I asked above the din, how are my stats today, Chris? Did I make any mistakes? In hindsight, that comment was my major blue of the day because I guess the last thing he wanted to see and hear after such a tense and tough match was me slurping on a beer in pristine playing gear while his troops were slumped on benches too tired to move. It was definitely one of my jokes which Chris had stopped laughing at. And much to my embarrassment, Angry Anderson exploded. You've got a fucking shithouse attitude, he yelled, causing people to look my way. Again, this is one of those situations where I'd love to hear someone else in the room like on how uh, McCracken delivered that line. I, reckon, how it was, that I reckon it was contemptuously <laughs> delivered. I reckon it was lariness dripping from him. <laughs> So funny, he was always one of my favourite players. Yeah, or well, he was a gun player. Yeah, but I mean, it's against my usual thing. Like, I'm not a Lair fan, yeah, generally. Yeah. <laughs> and so the end for McCracken at Canterbury came when his version of events was he called up to see when training was and was told by the girl on the desk that there was no training that day. So he didn't go. And then he showed up, you know, a couple of days later and, and got sacked because... He didn't have a good excuse for missing training. The girl at the desk. <laughs> and Chris Anderson came out and said, he didn't show up to training on Monday. And then when he came on Wednesday, he didn't have a decent excuse. So I rang him and told him that he wasn't in the train on squad anymore. And he was then asked if McCracken had severed all ties with the Bulldogs for 1995. Anderson said, forever, I hope. Look, it's no big deal. It was an attitude thing. We didn't want that sort of attitude around here. So with that, McCracken was forced to sit and watch as Canterbury went on to win a grand final without him, which, right or wrong, that would have been really tough to go through. Especially after 94. Yeah, exactly. And the other players all rallied around him to some point. Like He retained on friendly terms with all of them. He said he called up Jason Hetherington briefly before the game to wish him well, but didn't accept any invitations to go to celebrations or anything. Just I think that would have made the hurt even worse. So that ended a very successful against the odds season for Canterbury. But of course, while all that was going on, there was also the situation of the four players and where they were going to end up in 1996. The three ones that were completely exonerated by the Bulldogs <laughs> and allowed to play the grand final. Yeah. And basically from the start, from early June, Parramatta were favourites to get all of them. Which I know it is a lot easier proposition when the salary cap's out the window. But basically, so the 28th of May 
it's all official, all out in public. By the 7th of June, Ian Heads in the Rugby League Week is reporting that the four players as a package were on their way to Parramatta. And McCracken at least met with North, South and Newcastle as well before deciding to sign with Parramatta. But it's funny how early everyone knew when where they were going. If it wasn't Parra, the local derby, would it have been... Surely it would have been a less of a furor. Well... Say they went to Norths. Yeah, I mean, but at that point, going to Norths, Manly or the Roosters, going to any three of those wouldn't have been good for the ARL. And even the, the rival ARL clubs saw the advantage in them going to Parramatta. Yeah, Parramatta it certainly made them jump up a few notches. Exactly. So Parramatta were a big club who'd been going on nearly a decade of mediocrity and at a time when the competition was about to be split, it was really important that they were back as a good team. They'd had only, uh, what, four years of naming the next Peter Sterling yeah. at that point. <laughs> 25 more to follow. <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> and so obviously the money was right on. The, the four did sign with Parramatta. But even though I remember all these players going to Parramatta, I don't think at the time I realised how weird it was that they basically bought an entire new squad. Yeah, yeah. Like, so in addition to the four Canterbury players, they got Gary Freeman, Aaron Raper, Adam Ritson, who are all fellow ARL refugees, as well as Nathan Barnes from Newcastle. Such a good uh, squad there. Yeah. And so basically their team that ran out for round two in 1996, their first game for the year, had only two players that were in the team Round one, 1995. Well, wow. talk about putting a broom through. Yeah. And they did eventually get good, you know, finishing high on the ladder, you know, from 97 on. But that first year, 96, what an utter disappointment, finishing 13th and, you know, well out of it. I know it takes time to build combinations, but... We in rugby league longer than any other sport. Yeah. <laughs> and even if they had have gone on to win the comp in 2001, as they should have it would have been without any of those players that they got for 96. So It's just another example of trying to buy a comp. Yeah. Never works. Mm. But it's just funny because you, you would remember at the time as well, like I remember like vitriol about Parramatta trying to buy a comp yep. and ridicule when it didn't work out. But surely in the midst of all this, you put that aside. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> It's so funny how buying a comp so frowned upon, yet you know, every club buys players every year. It's just you've got to have the right mix of local juniors exactly. to get and, respect. And every every club hates other clubs buying a comp, but when they do it, it's... <laughs> <laughs> so the, before they could play with Parramatta, though, they had a court case to win. And as I said, this court case and the bigger one of ARL versus Super League, this is where a lot of those revelations were being played out and in fact the and in fact it was the Parramatta court case that kicked off first so it was this case where you're getting all those contract figures being revealed and for the first time the public are getting to understand the underhanded manner in which Super League went about signing players I think the best ever fly in the wall situation would have been Rebo and that sitting in the lawyer's office mm. going, so tell us how you signed the contracts. <laughs> you know, well, it was cloak and dagger in the middle of the night, midnight, and um, Simon Gillies was not allowed to contact his wife. The lawyers would be like, <laughs> mouth would be hitting the floor. <laughs> and Rebo got slammed in court because of this. Uh, one of the ARL lawyers put the question to him, so you left your, your post chief executive of the Broncos to take the job at Super League. How long were you given to sign that contract? And <laughs> he, he got two weeks to make the decision. <laughs> so eventually they did win their court case and were released from their Super League contracts. Does that mean backflip is a legal precedent? Well, I think the validity of the contracts was tested and... <laughs> due to all the things we're talked about. That's the thing. Like, I think basically any Super League player who signed in the first week could have got out of that contract legally. He cited the case of league player and homesickness Yeah, <laughs> since 1908. <laughs> and so after the court case, they ran into 
Ken Arthurson and John Quayle, who's that, you know, they were ecstatic at what had happened because, you know, for one, it, it set them up pretty good to go on and win the main court case. See, I love the fact that like rugby league men are down at Downing Centre, wherever the hell the court case was at, treating it like a game. Like, this, like you know, we have to play hard. The lawyers got to go hard. It could, could go either way, like <laughs> where it's pretty much known beforehand what's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> but they'd be like, they're biting the nails. Is full time happened yet? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and my favorite part of this was when uh, McCracken went home and uh, after the court case and saw a fax come through on the fax machine that Super League had installed at his house <laughs> with a uh, you know press release telling players not to be dissuaded about the events of that court case we still expect to be underway <laughs> in 1996. God. And that was basically where the the saga of the Filthy Four ended. After being re- released from their Super League contracts, Canterbury eventually let them go and be free to play with Parramatta. The ARL had one of their key clubs strengthened for 1996. Uh, and as for Canterbury, we'll hear all about how they went at a later date. So that's this week's episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I don't want to oversell it, but we'll be back next week with uh, one of my favorite episodes to research so uh, look forward to that as always would love to hear your thoughts about this episode send them through to the rugby league digest at gmail.com hit us up on facebook twitter instagram we cover all bases these days tiktok soon tiktok so uh thanks for listening and we'll speak to you next time Toodaloo.